So um, Brandon Albert is going to talk about sieves. Thanks, Brandon. It's recording. Okay. Uh, thanks, Alvaro. Uh, so I made an announcement on the Piazza page about the various resources that are available right now. I want to reiterate the main points. Uh, these slides, I have the blank slides available on Piazza for you to look at. Uh, if you want to review a couple of slides before we start a lecture, or if you want to follow along on the slides while we're doing the lecture, uh, however you feel is best to keep up with what we're doing. Uh, I also have the problem set posted on Piazza, uh, as well as Alvaro's posted it on the CPNT website. Got a bunch of problems. Uh, they're organized by section of the lecture so that you know when we've gotten far enough in the lecture to do which kinds of problems. Um, there's a lot of problems. Some of them are harder than the other ones. I put stars on the really hard problems. Don't necessarily expect to do every problem, but try to do a few problems if you're going to work on this assignment. Uh, I also mention on Piazza that the, the main resource that I'm following for this lecture series is the book, An Introduction to Civ Methods and Their Applications by Kojikaru and Murdy. I, I'm working through some of the material in select chapters of that book. So if you're looking for an introduction to sieves in a textbook form with more sieves in it, uh, that's a very good resource. All right, let's get started. So first gonna be an introduction, a couple of slides of introduction. It's no homework for the introduction. We're just gonna kind of talk about what is a sieve. And so, the first exposure that most people have to a sieve is something kind of like a pasta strainer. Uh, it allows you to separate water from pasta. You really want to have the pasta, but you make it by boiling it in water and you want to get rid of the water before you eat it. Uh, that's what a pasta strainer does. And that's kind of what sieves do in number theory. Uh, a very good mathematical example to think of for sieves is you think of all positive integers Maybe you don't want to look at all positive integers. Maybe you only want to look at the prime numbers. And so the sieve of Eratosthenes separates out prime numbers from all the other numbers, kind of like a pasta strainer. All the composite numbers fall through all the holes, only leaving the prime numbers left over. Uh, I have another bullet point. This is a little bit more nostalgic for me. The first time that I heard the word sieve was in the context of the gold rush uh, to California. There's a sieve that you can use to pick up dirt from a river, shake it around, all the dirt will fall out and hopefully leave some gold in it. All right, so let's do, let's walk through the sieve of Eratosthenes, the sieve that separates out prime numbers from all other numbers uh, as sort of a picture argument. So here I've put up a box that has the first 100 positive integers in it. And we're going to find all the prime numbers between 1 and 100. Now, what I'm going to do up on this board is probably one of the first results you'll see if you Google like prime numbers or the word sieve and prime numbers. But that's OK. Let's go through this. So we start with 1. 1's not a prime number. There are various reasons for that. Um, if you're interested after the lecture, we can talk a little bit more about the reasons why one is not a prime number. Uh, but going past that, the next smallest number is two. Two is a prime. And so what the sieve of Eratosthenes tells you to do is, okay, we found a prime number two. That means that every number that's divisible by two cannot be a prime. So that's all of these numbers, everything that ends in a 2, 4, 6, 8, or 0. So that eliminates a bunch of composite numbers. So then we look at what's left over. The next smallest number that's left over is a 3. 3 is not divisible by anything smaller than it, so it must be a prime. So continuing along with a sieve, we found a prime 3. Now we know that we can eliminate more things. We eliminate everything that's divisible by 3. So 3, 6, 9, and I'm not going to count through all the numbers below 100 that are divisible by 3. I'm just going to start picking them out following along this uh, 
diagonal pattern. And then 99. All right. Pretty sure I got them all. That removes all the numbers divisible by 3. We keep going. We've gotten rid of all composite numbers that are divisible by 2 and 3. So the next smallest number, 5, has to be prime. It's not divisible by anything smaller than itself. Now we remove everything divisible by 5. Well, those are the things that end in 5 or 0. We already got rid of all the things ending in 0. So now I'm just getting rid of the things that end in 5. The next smallest number is 7. Now we need to get rid of all the things divisible by 7. Uh, most of them are already gone. I think the only ones that aren't are 49, 77, and 91. So those are all the composite numbers divisible by 7. And this process keeps going. You're hopefully starting to sense a pattern here. So the next smallest number is 11. But now I can stop. I don't have to walk through the whole process again and say, all right, I'm going to look for all the numbers that are divisible by 11. The reason why I can stop is because the numbers that are divisible by 11 that are in this box, we already crossed them all out. Uh, those numbers all lie in a diagonal. It's 22, 33, 44, 55, all the way down to 99. But those numbers are all already gone. And so this is because if n is smaller than x, is not prime, then n is equal to a product of a prime number times something else. So it's composite. It's got at least one prime factor. Where p is a prime number that's no bigger than the square root of x. So if you take any composite number and look at the smallest prime number dividing it, that can't be larger than the square root of x. Because otherwise, you would have a product of two numbers that were bigger than the square root of x. Their product has to be bigger than x itself. And so in this picture, we eliminated all the multiples of 2, 3, 5, and 7. Those are all the primes below 10. And so this picture, we've eliminated exactly all the composite numbers below 100. So everything else in this picture is a prime number. And that's the sieve of Eratosthenes. And we can see some ideas here about sieves that are going to come up a little bit more rigorously uh, when we're working through this process in detail. The idea of eliminating sets of numbers we don't care about. The idea of not having to do a sieve all the way up to 100 in this example, or all the way up from n up to x. However large of number we want to consider, we don't necessarily need to go all the way up to x with our process of eliminating things. In this case, we only had to go up to square root of x. We only had to eliminate multiples of numbers that were below 10 in order to find all primes below 100. And that will help us to count things and find some nice error terms and such. All right. That's the, the introduction to this whole mini course. And so there are six sections to the mini course after this. Uh, to start with, we're going to have a couple of sections of sort of a buildup of some basics of analytic number theory. We're going to build, so, build up some terminology so that we're ready to talk about sieves and talk about error terms and sieves and all of that kind of stuff. So this first section, asymptotic notation and arithmetic functions, is going to build up the basic language that we will use to sort of study these questions about finding prime numbers or finding other kinds of numbers, different things like that. All right. So we'll start off an arithmetic function. This is just a function from the natural numbers or the positive integers or the integers to the complex numbers. And these functions 
you can use them to study arithmetic behaviors and they sort of allow you to transfer from arithmetic to settings where analysis will work. So I have several examples of important arithmetic functions, many of which you'll find in the problem set. Uh, so I think seeing lots of examples of this are very useful. So let's say we have a function that tells you for any integer n, it's equal to the number of distinct prime divisors which divide n. That's an arithmetic function. It takes in an integer and it spits out some other integer. And integers are complex numbers. Now, depending on your background, you may have also seen this function denoted with an omega instead of a nu. I'm going to use the Greek letter nu uh, because that's the letter that the textbook I'm following along uses. And they have another role for omega in this book. So I'm going to reserve that for a different role. Following along this theme of divisibility, we can look at just the number of divisors that divide n. Not necessarily prime, not necessarily distinct, which I definitely spelled wrong. It's also a perfectly fine function. This is sometimes denoted sigma naught n as well. It's got another notation. The Euler phi function is another very important example. It appears in the problem set. Uh, and this one, many of you are likely to have seen before in a number theory class or in an abstract algebra class. This is the number of integers between 1 and n, inclusive of 1. Which are co prime to n. And the Greek letter phi has two scripts, depending on who it is that's writing it. Uh, this function is very important in abstract algebra because it also counts the number of invertible elements in the ring z mod n z. I look at the number of invertible elements in that ring. That is also the size of the Euler phi function. All right. The last example is a pretty important one. It's a bit more of a broad idea. Let's say that we have a subset of the natural numbers. Then we can look at the characteristic function of this subset. So this is a function that when you plug in an integer n, it's equal to 1 if n belongs to this special set a, and it's equal to 0 otherwise. This is an arithmetic function. It sends an integer to either 1 or 0, which are both complex numbers. And this arithmetic function contains all the information about the set a. So this is a very useful kind of function, a way to translate sets of numbers into functions into the complex numbers. And so a very useful set you might consider in this context, you might say, let's look at all the prime numbers. What's the characteristic function of the prime numbers? That's equal to 1 if you plug in a prime. It's equal to 0 if you plug in a composite number. Uh, and we can ask analytic questions about that kind of function. All right, so let's pick one of these functions, look at it a little bit more in depth. So we're going to look at the divisor function. Uh, so this, again, is the number of positive divisors of n. And in a second, I'm going to pull up CoCalc, which is the online SAGE calculator, uh, to show you some pictures about what this function sort of looks like. So before I pull up that picture, let's say a few things uh, that we know about this function. Let's say that we plug in a prime number. Well, prime numbers 
only have two positive divisors. They're only divisible by one and themselves. So no matter what prime number you plug in, it has exactly two divisors. And we know there are infinitely many prime numbers, so we know that this divisor function is equal to two infinitely many times. Sort of in the opposite direction, we could plug in a power of two into this divisor function. Now powers of two are divisible by exactly the smaller powers of two. So two to the k, that's divisible by one, two, two squared, two cubed, etc., all the way up to two to the k. If you count those out, that is k plus one possible divisors. So this is kind of the opposite of what's happening with the primes. There are infinitely many prime numbers, so there are infinitely many places where the number of positive divisors is just two. But there are also infinitely many powers of two, and so we can see the number of positive divisors of an integer it can also be made as large as we want by picking an arbitrarily large power of two. Okay. So let's actually do some graphs here. So I believe Alvaro in the computational number theory course is going to talk to you a little bit more about co-calc in one of his lectures, or maybe he already does in the introductory SAGE lecture. I don't know if Albert wants to chime in and say if that's in that lecture or not. So I already taught, uh, I already have a video up on, on SAGE math, how to use some of these things. And uh, I discussed it a little bit today in the lecture, in my first lecture, and tomorrow we'll be doing more. I'm taking notes of what you're doing. And I will probably dig in a little uh, more on what you are trying to do here. Okay. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to plot the graph of a divisor function. Now, Sage sees a divisor function uh, as sigma zero. So that's what I've got highlighted right here. That's a divisor function. So I'm plotting the points n comma the number of divisors of n. So what I've made is a set of points. Uh, then we're going to define the plot of those points as P1, and I'm just going to run P1. And if I've done it right, this should I don't have a run button on here. I'm, I, I'm, it, this might not be a Sage worksheet. It might be some sort of like. I think you might be right. I, hope I have a Sage worksheet on the other screen. Okay. That's the one. That one. All right, let's try this again. I have the same thing written, but now it's a Sage worksheet. So we're going to run this. And here I've plotted all the points that lie in the divisor function from 0 to 100. And you can see that this picture, it's really scattered. The, the behavior of the divisor function is very erratic. And maybe this isn't so surprising based off of what we saw already about the behavior of the divisor function. We see all the primes along this bottom row where the number of divisors is two. We will also see there are some numbers with lots of divisors. And if I make this between one and a thousand, we start to see a few more patterns. We see that some of these rows have more values than the other ones. These are specifically the rows for even numbers. So it looks like in this picture, you're more likely to have an even number of divisors than an odd number of divisors. Uh, we can sort of see a pattern of the maximal growth of this function, but it's, it's all jumbled around in between here. And so I'm going to go back to 100. One of the ways that we can address this and study arithmetic functions using analytic techniques is we want to take this type of function and smooth it out. So let me go back for one second, go to the next slide here. So we're going to smooth out our arithmetic function. Rather than just studying the values of the function itself, we're going to take a sum of all the values below x. And think of that as a function of a real number. So why is this going to 
smooth out our graph. Well, the function d of n, that's always a positive number. And so every time we add more positive numbers, the only thing that can happen to it is that we'll go up. All right. So I'll grab this. So what I'm doing here is I'm writing, I'm going to plot out the smoothed out function. So you can see I have sum of divisor function for n between 1 and x. And I'm running x from 1 to 100. And I'm just making it a different color. So let's run this. Now, it still looks pretty jagged. It looks like a staircase. but it looks a lot closer to an analytic function, something that you could study using calculus. If you ignore all these little stair steps here, it kind of just looks like a curve. This will make things a lot easier to give analytic results and talk about error terms and different things like that. And so here's what I'm going to show you uh, as far as this function is concerned and comparing it to an analytic function. And then we'll go back to the slides and we'll be done with OCalc. So what I'm going to do, I'll make it a different color. I'm going to graph the function x times log x. So here log is the natural log. And we're going to compare this to the smoothed out divisor function. And if I want to graph two of these at the same time, I just add the two plots together. You'll notice I made them different colors so that we can tell them apart. Let's see what this looks like. All right. So hopefully you can see the, the enough detail on my screen here. We have this nice smooth blue curve, which is x times log x. And it looks really, really close to this red stair step curve, which is the sum of the number of divisors of n for n less than or equal to x. Brendan? Yes. It looks good. I, I can see it fine, but you can do control plus to make it a little bigger, perhaps. Um, yep, that looks great. Yeah. All right. And so this is going to be kind of the, the main framework that we're going to work in with sieves. We're going to talk about comparing these smooth out functions to analytic functions so that we can use calculus and other analytic techniques. Uh, to get at some of these results. We'll be able to talk about what does it really mean mathematically to say these two functions are close, besides just that their pictures look the same. All right. So we're done with CoCalc. Let's write what I just said on this slide. This function is close to x log x, where close to right now just means their pictures look the same. But we're going to talk about more rigorously what does that mean for us. And I'll just write on this slide. We use log x to mean the natural log of x, or log base e. This is a convention used in analytic number theory. I couldn't tell you why. Probably somebody at some point liked how log looked better than natural log. There might be a better reason that I'm just not aware of. OK. Let's define what we mean by close to. We're going to say that two functions are close together if the ratio of those two functions is really close to one. In fact, we'll say a little bit more than that. We'll say that these two functions are asymptotic. So the asymptotic word here, this is going to be our word for close to. Asymptotic. These two functions are asymptotic if the limit of their ratio as x tends to infinity is equal to one. So what that says is if x is really, really large, f of x divided by g of x should be about 1. 
which is like saying those two functions are close to the same thing. So our picture in CoCalc suggests that these two functions are close. Or we can write it as a limit, limit as x goes to infinity of the sum of the number of divisors of n for n less than or equal to x divided by log x is equal to 1. OK. Now it'll take a little bit of build up before we can actually prove this for the divisor function. So let's start with a simpler example. is the floor function. So the floor function of a real number x is written with these, they look like brackets, except they only have the underside coming in and the top is not. This is equal to the greatest integer less than or equal to x. Alternatively, the floor function is equal to the sum over all integers less than or equal to x of 1. So think about the arithmetic function that set, just sends every integer to 1. If you try to smooth that out using this sum over n less than or equal to x idea, you get the floor function of x. So we can graph this the same way we graph the divisor function in CoCalc, and I'm just going to do it by hand because it's pretty quick. This function, well, everywhere below 1, it's going to look like 0. Everywhere between 1 and 2, it'll look like 1. Between 2 and 3, it'll be 2. Between 3 and 4, it will look like 3. I made that a little long and etc. I'm just going to draw vertical lines to make it look nice and connected. So that's the floor function of x graph. Now, by comparison, this graph this doesn't look a whole lot different than just x. And really, this makes a lot of sense. The floor function of x, it's only going to drop you down a little bit. It'll only drop you down by at most 1. Because any real number is no more than a distance of 1 away from any other integer. And so that sort of reasoning says, hey, these two functions should be close together. So what we're going to do on the next slide is we're actually going to prove that these two functions are close together in the sense that we defined on this slide, that they're asymptotic to each other. So that's what we've got here on this slide, that the floor function is asymptotic to x itself. And so the proof is going to be an application of the squeeze theorem, or the sandwich theorem, depending on uh, which terminology you learned in calculus or analysis. We know that the floor function is less than or equal to x. This is by definition. The floor function is the largest integer that's also below x. So it has to be smaller than x. But also, we know that the floor function plus 1, that's another integer higher. Anytime you have an integer and you add 1 to it, it has to be a bigger integer. Well, the floor function of x was the biggest possible integer that was below x. So if we go up to the next highest integer, that's got to be bigger than x. So we'll rearrange this to get a lower bound for the floor function of x. The floor function of x is bigger than x minus 1. Okay.
So our goal, we want to find the limit as x goes to infinity of the quotient of these two functions. In fact, we want to show that this limit is equal to 1 in order for these two functions to be asymptotic to each other. Well, I already told you we were going to do this as an application of the squeeze theorem. This fraction is trapped between x minus 1 over x and x over x. Well, x over x is equal to 1. x minus 1 over x is 1 minus 1 over x. The limits of both sides are equal to 1. So the squeeze theorem that tells you if you have a function that's bounded between two other functions, but the other two functions have the same limit, then the function in the middle must also have the same limit. And that's exactly the definition of this notion of closeness or asymptotic. And so we've actually proven that this notion of closeness agrees with our picture in this case, that the floor function of x is really close to just the function x. All right. So going on from this point, we're going to get a little bit more detailed in what we mean by closeness. We might say that floor function of x is close to x, but a follow-up question might be, how close are they? Can we talk about the error? in this sort of approximation. If we say that the floor function is approximately x, it's a perfectly natural question to follow up and say, what's the error in that approximation? And so we're going to talk about error using two ideas. And they're both going to be on this next slide, called little o and big O. So little o and big O, these are both descriptions of error terms. So we'll do this one at a time. First, little o. f of x is little o of g of x. What this means intuitively is that f of x is asymptotically smaller than g of x. So this is going to be a way that we can talk about, does this thing belong to an error term? Is our error smaller than some function we can describe? We would, if it is, we would say, oh, our error is little o of this function. And the explicit definition is that we take a limit of their ratios again, except now that that limit is equal to zero. So if you have a fraction that tends to zero, what that means is that eventually the numerator has to be much smaller than the denominator. So this is what we're going to think of as being asymptotically smaller than. All right. The next notion of error is big O. This is closely related to little o, and in fact, we're going to use big O a little bit more often than little o, because big O obeys a few more nice properties that we want our errors to satisfy. It'll be easier to work with. So sometimes you'll see big O notation. Sometimes you'll see these double inequalities. That means the same thing as big O. And the idea for big O is it's kind of like a less than or equal to. This says that the function f of x is asymptotically the same order of magnitude or smaller than g of x. It's like a less than or equal to uh, up to constant multiple. So there's two definitions that you can think about for this one. Uh, the definition that's most often used is this one. There exists a constant c greater than 0, such that the absolute value of f of x is less than or equal to that constant times g of x for all sufficiently large values of x. So what that's saying is up to some constant multiple, f of x can't get any bigger than g of x, at least once you pass a certain threshold of x values. Maybe you want to, if you want to think about 1 over x, you don't want to talk about x close to zero because that's a 
It's a very bad behavior, and it's only for very small x. And we're going to be thinking about x tending towards infinity. The other definition, which I include on the slide, is this lim soup definition. And I'm including it because it follows the theme of taking a limit as x goes to infinity. It kind of matches the theme for little o, and it matches the theme for asymptotic too. And one thing you can see at the bottom of this slide, I put an exercise, which asks you to prove that if you have two functions which are asymptotic, then one of them is big O of the other. This lines up with the idea that big O is kind of like less than or equal to. If you have a function that's the same order of magnitude, then it must also be the same order of magnitude or smaller. So this is a good exercise to sort of get your hands on this definition. OK. And so the way that we're going to use big O and little o, we're going to use it to talk about error terms. So what we'll do a lot is we'll break a function apart into some other function plus some big O or some little o, where we'll call this first function the main term. And the big O piece will be the error term. And so what this means is, well, if you take the function f of x and subtract g of x, that, that difference is no bigger than h of x, or a constant multiple times h of x. So this is how we're going to measure the error. We'll take a difference of two functions and say that that difference is not very big. So again, there's another exercise here. This kind of notation is reminiscent of cosets of ideals of a ring. So if you think back to abstract algebra, when you have an ideal of a ring and you take a quotient by that ideal, you get a new ring, which is the ring of cosets. And you write those cosets as some element plus that ideal. That's exactly the same thing that's happening here. So this exercise asks you to prove that big O of a function and little o of a function are actually ideals in the ring of functions. Okay, so this is a lot of words and definitions all at once. Uh, at this point, we're going to go back to our example. The example that the floor function of x is asymptotic to x. And we're going to ask ourselves, well, how close are they? Can we say something about the error term? And so that is what we've got on this next slide. The floor function of x is equal to x, the main term, plus big O of 1. That's the only thing that's there for the error term. So big O of 1, that's saying this is something that's there exists some constant that bounds it above. It's uniformly bounded by a constant. So that's not a very big error term. And the proof is. Well, it uses basically the same ideas that we use when we show these two functions were asymptotic to each other. Our goal is to find a bound for the absolute value of the difference of these two functions. Well, we know from last time the floor function is bounded below by x. And the floor function is bounded above by x minus 1. So these are the exact same bounds we used in the last proof. So this tells us if we take the difference, floor function minus x, that's no bigger than 0 and no smaller than negative 1. So if we put them in absolute values, that tells us the absolute value of the difference of these two functions is no bigger than 1. Well, 1 is definitely equal to a constant times 1. So there exists a constant. greater than 0, such that 
the absolute value of the floor function of x minus x is less than or equal to c times 1 for all x bigger than or equal to 0. And I'll write it in red. We can choose c equals 1 for that constant. This is the definition of saying the floor function of x minus x is big O of 1. So then the last step would be to add the x back over to the other side. So now with this example, we can say more. We know more than just the floor function and x are close together. We know that they're very close. The error is big O of 1. The error is no bigger than a constant. So this is going to be the kind of statement that we're going to produce with sieves and with other methods that we're going to learn in this mini course. We're going to talk about some very arithmetic types of functions, like the floor function. And we'll say, OK, these arithmetic functions, they're, they're kind of jumpy. They look like staircases. They got a bunch of corners. But they're really close to some kind of differentiable function. And so we'll say, oh, it's really close to this differentiable function. And then we'll say, well, we know that it's so close to this differentiable function that the error in that approximation is no bigger than some other differentiable function. Those are going to be the, the kinds of statements that we're going to produce with sieves. All right. Now, the last thing uh, in this section, I have a slide here. It's got a bunch of exercises on it. All these exercises are stated again in the problem set. Uh, if you haven't had a, if you haven't seen big O or little O notation before, I highly recommend you do these exercises. They really help you wrap your head around what's going on with the big O and little O. Most of these properties are all about what's true for ideals, and they're about things that you'd want to be true for error terms, uh, like this fourth property. If f of x is no bigger than g of x, well, you would expect that a sum of a bunch of values for the function f is no bigger than the sum of a bunch of the same values for g. You don't think of sums as being something that breaks an inequality. And so all these properties are saying that our intuitive notion of big O and little o as being kind of like an inequality, it works in many aspects. They obey many of the same properties that inequalities do. Okay, so that's the end of that section. We have another section that I want to at least get started talking about, but I think now might be a good time to stop uh, for questions. Yep. Is there anyone anyone uh, has a question for Brendan? Uh, I see one question, uh, Ajmane. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing your name correctly, asked what program I'm using to write on the slides. Uh, this program is called Drawboard PDF. Uh, it has a, a free trial for some number of days, but I did pay some amount of money for it. Um, just a reminder to everyone, if you could ask your questions to all the panelists, that way I can also see if there is a question and uh, I can try to answer them myself also while, while uh, Brandon is talking. Any any other questions? All right. Yes. Not. If they're good, so you can keep going. We can have uh, some more questions after you finish. Yeah. Okay. So the next section. You have about another six, seven minutes. Yeah. This next section is about Abel summation. This is sorry, Brendan. One one question did come in. Okay. Could you explain what number one is asking in the homework? What number one is asking? So what this is asking, maybe I'll write it out in more detail. If you have a function h of x, which you know is big O of g of x, then you can show that f of x times h of x is big O of f of x times g of x. It sort of respects multiplication, similar to how inequality, how an actual inequality works. 
If you have this big O relationship, you can multiply both sides by some function and it will still respect this big O relationship. All right, I hope that answers your question. Uh, Ken asks in the chat, just making sure G has to be a positive function here. Um, yeah, you really want G to be a positive function. I guess if I go back to the definition, maybe if I put absolute values on the G here, it still works out. But typically, you want G to be a positive function so that you can just make sure to keep track of this upper bound is positive and you're talking about positive things. You don't want to worry about signs with the big O and little o. And it will happen a lot of the times that, like in this case, the error here, really, this should be a negative number. And we really still want our negative numbers to belong to an error term of some positive function, just to say that its magnitude can be no bigger than the thing that's inside this function. So yes, it would be preferable to keep all your G functions positive. So you don't have to worry about uh, those nuances of signs. It wouldn't be true. You couldn't add the right size if they weren't. You, can you speak up, Keith? It wouldn't be, I mean, if you wanted to add, add error terms, they were allowed to be positive and negative, it would kind of mix things up. You couldn't just have a clean statement. Yes, you'd have to be careful with adding functions if you allowed them to be both positive and negative. They wouldn't cancel out uh, the way you might expect the functions to cancel out themselves. There is another question, Brendan, in the q and I I don't know if you want to take care of that now or later. Um, maybe, well, maybe I'll just direct you to the problem set on the homework assignment. In the, ho in the problem set on the homework assignment, I tell you which properties have to do with being an ideal and which ones don't. Uh, there's a little bit more detail in the problem set than I have on this slide. So I'll just direct that question to the problem set. OK, let's at least start talking about the next section before we finished for today. This next section, this is about Abel summation. This is a very useful technique for evaluating partial sums. And so I've got this big long theorem on this slide. The idea is if you take a partial sum of some sequence times the values of some differentiable function, then that sum is equal to this expression using integrals, where capital A of x is a partial sum of just the sequence. f of x is the function. Here, f prime of t is the derivative of that function. And this looks a lot like integration by parts. And in fact, a lot of the proof is very similar to integration by parts. And so I've written this in a way that resembles integration by parts a little bit more. So the idea is you break partial sum up as u equals f of t and dv equals the sequence a sub n. And we go with this analogy that an integral is like a Riemann sum. So we should really think of a partial sum as being like a discrete version of an integral. So when we do integration by parts, we have to find du, which is f prime of t dt. And then v, what's supposed to be the antiderivative of our sequence, is really like a discrete antiderivative, which is a partial sum of the sequence. And that's exactly, maybe I'll write this as t. That's exactly what we define capital A of t to be equal to. And then we plug this stuff into the integration by parts formula, u times v, that's f times capital A, and then v times du, that's a times f prime of t, and then the bounds y to x are the same as the bounds on our partial sum. And so we're almost out of time. I'll just finish this with one example of using Abel summation to compute the value of some partial sum.
So we're going to compute the value of a partial harmonic series. And using Abel's summation, we'll actually go all the way through and come up with a main term, which is log of x, and then an error term. So log of x is actually really close to this partial sum. It's at most off by a constant. So we do Abel's summation, where our sequence, little a sub n, is just ones. So we know the partial sum of a bunch of ones, that's the floor function. Our function is one over t. One times one over t is you know, one over t. And then you plug in the different integers. Then f prime of t is negative one over t squared. So what I'll do, I'll take the harmonic series pull off the first term so I can get this lower bound to look like what we expect it to look like. And so then our formula will have the first term still hanging around. Capital A of t, which is the floor function of t, times f of t from 1 to x, minus the integral from 1 to x of capital A of t, times f prime of t. Now we've found an explicit formula for this partial sum. We'll plug in a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, if we plug in x, we get floor function of x over x. Plugging in the 1 down here, that'll cancel out with this 1 over 1. That'll go away. I'm not going to write it. And plus the integral from 1 to x floor function of t over t squared dt. And then what we're going to do, the last sort of big step, is to use the fact that we already proved the floor function of t is equal to t plus big O of 1. So, this first term, floor function of x, that's equal to x plus big O of 1. In this integral, we get t plus big O of 1 over t squared dt. So now on this last line that I can fit on the slide, I'll break this all apart into multiple pieces. x over x is 1. Big O of 1 divided by x. Well, that's like 1 over x times something that's big O of 1. So we were just talking about how multiplication respects this, these sorts of big O error terms. So if we multiply some function that's big O of 1 by 1 divided by x, the result is big O of 1 over x. Then we have the integral of 1 over t dt. One of the other properties that's going to be on your problem set for today is that big O not only respects multiplication, but it respects integration. So this last term, big o, integral of big O of 1 divided by t squared, you can pull the big O all the way to the outside like that. And so all that's left for us to do is to match up how do these terms correspond to the result we expect to get? Well, the integral of 1 over t from 1 to x, that is exactly log x. And we'll do, uh, no, I don't want to do red. I guess I'll do blue. 1. Well, 1 is definitely big O of 1, because it's just the same function. Big O of 1 over x. 1 over x, at least if x is bigger than 1, 1 over x is going to be less than or equal to 1. So that tells you that actually this particular term is a smaller term than big O of 1. So it falls under the same error. And all that's left is this big O. I'm starting to run out of room on this slide, but it, 
this is an integral that you can actually compute. If you integrate one over t squared, that's negative one over t. So this is actually big O of one minus one over x when you plug in the two bounds. And once again, one minus one over x, well, at least if x is bigger than one, this is gonna be some positive number that's smaller than one. So it will also fall in this error term. It'll be no bigger than big O of one. And that's all the terms in this partial sum. So this is kind of the big utility of Abel's summation. It takes this very discrete behavior of a partial sum, this very sort of arithmetic behavior, and it converts it into a lot of analytic behavior. All right, so that's where I'm going to stop for today. We'll have a little bit more in the Abel summation section uh, to do tomorrow. And that's it. Does anybody have any questions?